So now we're still going off of what's in um, chapter 11. The, the way they have it arranged it doesn't make sense to me because they have the terminology at the end and then they talk about um, individual devices um, and then they talk about general um, terminal and uh, general um, uses and um, electrical uh, action potentials and that sort of thing. So, so I did terminology first, then action potentials, and now we're going to talk about devices and electrodes. And I'm probably going to divide this up into two sections just because there's a lot of information. I want to chunk it up a little bit more. So in general, for the learning objectives, um, I want you to be able to state the general contraindications and precautions for ESTEM and know why ESTEM is harmful in those individual situations. It's not just rote memorization of contraindications and precautions. You want to know why it's harmful and why you don't want to do it. Um, and this is something that we might need to educate our patients about as well. So in the book, I really like the way they do this, and I've probably, I know I've said this in other lectures too, when they're talking about contraindications and precautions, they have questions you should ask your patient. And I would love to hear you ask those questions when you're doing the practical, when you have to ask about contraindications and precautions, ask some of those questions that are in the book. I really like that. So the other thing too is it's important that we screen our patients for, um, for appropriateness and contraindications for electrical stim. Don't assume that the PT has done it at the initial evaluation. You need to take responsibility for um, what you are doing to the patient. So make sure that you know that these contraindications are not present. Um, I want you to be able to state the general clinical indications for eSTEM, and then we'll talk more specifically about them in the other chapters. Um, I want you to know why you would choose one type of electrode versus another. So um, carbon impregnated versus self-adhering. When would you use individual ones? When and why? Um, I want you to know about how the size, condition, and placement of electrodes, as well as your skin prep, affect the treatment. So um, that there's definitely some effect. Um, the, probably the easiest one, describing monopolar, bipolar, and quadrupolar electrode setups, one, two, and four electrodes. <laughs> so um, we'll talk about them. And how close together or far apart they should be and why. Um, I want you to be able to explain general safety considerations when using electrical um, currents therapeutically. So not just um, safety with the patient, but safety with the devices. So the general contraindications and precautions for electrical currents are um, having a demand cardiac pacemaker or an implant implanted defibrillator. You also, even though they're not specifically mentioned, um, you want to be careful with any implanted electrical device. Or if somebody has unstable arrhythmia, because it's an electrical issue with their heart, you just don't want to affect that. So you want to ask the patient, do you have a cardiac pacemaker or an implanted cardiac defibrillator? You can even expand that, say, do you have any sort of um, implanted device? Um, when have, uh, do you have a history of heart problems or have you been treated for heart problems? Um, what type of heart problems do you have? That's always good to know. Um, how recently has your doctor checked your heart? And you're going to assess the patient. You're going to check the patient visually for a surgical scar and or, and or feel for placement of a device under the skin. So in this um, x-ray here, it shows a pacemaker um, and the lead, the, car, the lead going into the heart. Normally, um, most of the time with a cardiac pacemaker, you're going to see a scar on the left side of the chest, just below the clavicle. That having been said, they might have it on the right side of their chest for some other reason that we don't know about. So don't just look at the left side of their chest and assume they don't have one on the right. Um, also, the uh, cardiac uh, pacemaker and the ICD are not the only devices they might have implanted, so they might have other devices. So you want to make sure you look. Don't just assume that they don't have anything. Um, and 
feel for a uh, palpate for a, an implanted device underneath the skin. Um, so some of the contraindications and precautions are for conditions that the patient has. Other ones such as don't place electrical stem over the carotid sinus. That's for anybody, not just someone with a cardiac condition because when you place electrodes on the anterior or lateral neck in areas over the carotid sinuses, um, you, if you stim those areas, you can induce a rapid fall in blood pressure or heart rate, and you may cause the patient to faint. And that's for anybody, not just someone with um, cardiac issues. You also don't want to place electrodes over venous or arterial thromboses um, because stimulation may increase circulation and increase the risk of releasing emboli that are then going to go to the heart or the brain and cause a problem. So we don't want to do that. We don't want to do any harm. That's our first thing. Um, so you want to ask the patient, do you have a blood clot in this area? Um, make sure you've checked their chart. Um, if you're in the hospital, you can talk to the nurse that's in charge of the patient. Make sure they know. Um, if you're in an outpatient setting, you really have to get your history from the patient. Um, you want to assess the area for increased swelling, redness, or increased tenderness. Um, if any of those things are present, don't apply electrical stimulation until um, the possibility of a clot has been ruled out. So you want them to be cleared before you do it. Um, pregnancy, um, you don't want to do electrical stim over the pelvis, abdomen, trunk, or low back area. The effects of electrical stim on a developing human being um, or on a pregnant woman have not been determined. So we don't know. Why take the chance? It's not worth it. I mean, theoretically, you could do electrical stim on somebody's ankle if they're pregnant or on their shoulder, but um, I feel like the shoulder's even too close. Um, I don't want to um, take the chance. And I think probably most pregnant women don't want to take the chance either. So um, if the, your patient is of childbearing age, you want to ask them if they're pregnant or if they could possibly be pregnant or if they're trying to get pregnant. Because if they are, they might not know for the first few days or weeks after conception. And that is a really important time developmentally. So you don't want to mess around with that. Um, you just um, it, It's just a good idea not to do that. So for precautions, if somebody has cardiac disease um, or impaired sensation or mentation or a malignancy or skin irritation or open wound, you might do electrical stim, you might not, but you want to be careful. So if somebody has cardiac disease, you might want to ask them if they have a history of cardiac disease, if they've had a previous myocardial infarction, if they've ever had rheumatic fever as a child or an adult. Um, and in pathophysiology, we talked about that in um, the cardiac chapter, how rheumatic fever affects the heart. Um, we want to ask them if they're aware of having any cardiac problems at this time. So again, you want to look for surgical incisions in the um, thoracic area, both anteriorly and posteriorly. You want to check their vitals, particularly their pulse, um, resting pulse and respiratory rate, before treatment, during treatment, and after treatment. So if you do go ahead, if they agree and you all agree that it's the right thing to do, you want to make sure you're really monitoring their vitals. Um, with someone with impaired sensation, you want to assess sensation in the area. Um, you want to assess their level of orientation and alertness and whether or not they're agitated. If somebody's agitated, um, Easton's not going to calm them down. <laughs> Likely. Yeah, it might, but probably not. So just be careful. Be cautious with that. Um, there's actually no research that explores the effects of applying electrical stim to malignant tumors, but because electrical currents can enhance tissue growth and increase circulation, um, in most cases it's recommended that you don't do electrical stim to patients with a known or suspected malignant tumor. Um, so you don't want to um, apply it to any area of the body because malignant tumors can metastasize to areas beyond where they're first found. 
So um, occasionally electrical stim might be used to control pain in patients with known malignancy, but it's done only when the improvement in the quality of life is um, considered to be greater than the possible risks associated with the treatment. So you want to really, you want to talk to the patient, you want to talk to the doctor. It's not a bad idea to get a written uh, permission from the doctor to proceed with electrical stim. Um, several years ago, I was working with someone who'd had open heart surgery, and I don't think he had an implanted device, but he had, it, it was a red flag, it was a precaution, and the doctor really wanted him to get um, microcurrent, which is subsensory, um, for pain management, and I was super cautious about it, and the guy was also kind of agitated, he was... Um, he was very afraid of the whole thing and so I called the doctor and talked to him and um, we decided to try some other interventions before we went to the electrical stim because um, there were just too many red flags so if somebody um, you want to ask someone if they've had cancer or if they've ever had it or if they have it now or if they have um, some of the other symptoms like unexplained weight loss Sometimes people will tell you stuff in PT. Um, they'll say, well, I've lost 40 pounds in the last two months, and I don't know why. And they can't figure, my doctor can't figure it out. Well, obviously something's going on. You want to be cautious with that person. They could easily have an undetected malignancy somewhere, and so you just probably want to lay off the electrical stem just in case. Um, with abraded skin or open wounds, unless electrical stim is being used to treat the wound. Um, open or damaged skin has lower impedance, it has lower resistance to current and less sensation than intact skin. So it might result in too much current to the area. So you want to inspect the patient's skin carefully before placing the electrodes. You want to check for redness, swelling, warmth, rashes, or broken or braided areas. And then if that's the case, you want to avoid those areas. Don't put the electrodes on those areas. You still might be able to do electrical stim if there's a, a place where you can place the electrodes to not irritate the wound. So potential adverse effects of electrical currents, you could cause burns. So this, um, you can see exactly where the electrodes are placed on this person's shoulder. Um, the current density of the electrodes is important. You want to avoid this kind of effect. Um, it can cause skin irritation, short of burns, um, and it can cause increased pain. So you need to be careful when you're applying um, electrical currents to people because there are potential adverse effects. So as far as um, types of electrical devices, I, I said alphabet soup here because there's so many different ones. TENS and NMES and HPVC and FES and IFC, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and a microvolt, high volt, Russian stim. Some of those letters refer, refer to applications, other refers to type of equipment. None of these um, refer to any kind of clinical efficacy. So, in other words, you can use TENS to do sensory level pain management, motor level pain management. You can use it to do muscle stim. You could use NMES to do sensory level pain management, motor level pain management, muscle stim. Um, you, can, you can use high voltage pulse current to do pain management. You can use it for wound healing. Um, you can use it for muscle stim in certain situations. The idea is the application you do doesn't depend on the device that you use. It depends on how you do the settings. You might choose one device over another because it has the settings that you want or it does a specific thing. Um, but like the functional electrical stim that it does a particular functional thing, like the one that stimulates the dorsiflexors for people with foot drop. Um, so you might use a specific device in that case. But the, all of the other devices, as long as you can adjust the settings how you want to, you can use them for multiple things. So a better way to look at it is think about purpose-driven terminology. So not what the machine is, TENS or NMES or whatever, but what you're using it for. 
So electrical stim for pain management. Electrical stim for sensory excitation. So it might be a component of motor relearning or it might be a component of pain control. Um, electrical stim for motor excitation. You might be doing neuromotor retraining. You might be doing strength or endurance enhancement. Um, electrical stim for wound healing. Electrical stim for transdermal medication transfer. In that case, you're probably using a specific device to do iontophoresis, but you're, th this is the purpose that you're doing it for. Once you know the type of current required to evoke a particular physiological effect and the type of current generated by a given device, you can select the equipment best suited to accomplish the treatment goals. That is the skilled therapy part of it, is you know the settings and the parameters well enough that you can use any machine to accomplish what you want to do. Most any machine. Hopefully that makes sense. And we'll talk about specific types of machines, which they start doing in Chapter 11, and then go more into it in Chapters 12 and 13 and 14. So types of current stimulators that might be specific to a particular thing, iontophoresis, you're going to use a continuous direct current device, or like this the little thing that looks like a Band-Aid with the plus and minus on it. Um, has a built-in battery, that's a, a purpose-specific device for iontophoresis. Um, they're very low amplitude, 0 to 4 milliamps. There's no frequency. Why do you think that is? See, I wish you guys were sitting right here with me and then you could answer. But um, there's no frequency because it's a direct, continuous current. Um, there's, it's not pulses, so the pulses per second, and it's not... Um, uh, cycle, so there's no cycles per second, so there's no frequency. It's just on or it's off. Um, there is a net DC component, which means charge builds up under one of the electrodes, um, and this is mostly used for iontophoresis and um, transcutaneous drug administration. So other types of devices for pain control or nerve or muscle stimulation include ones that have different waveforms, um, usually in the ones we're using therapeutically besides iontophoresis have no net charge, zero net charge, so no DC component. Um, pulse currents or alternating currents, amplitudes between zero and 100 milliamps. Remember the iontophoresis was zero to four. Um, short pulse durations, um, because we're not going to stimulate those um, larger fibers, so 20 to 500 microseconds. Variable frequency between 1 and 100 pulses per second or cycles per second. Modulations, meaning we can vary the pulse duration, the frequency, and the amplitude to prevent accommodation. Um, you can, we can use lots of different types of current stimulators to stimulate sensory and or motor responses. We can use them for pain management, muscle strength augmentation, neuromuscular retra retraining, joint range of motion facilitation, or orthotic substitutes. Um, in other words, we're going to use an active device for dorsiflexion instead of a passive AFO. And we'll talk about that in the muscle stim chapter. So in the next section, we're going to talk about um, some specific device applications that we will be using in the lab.